Praise the Lord, everybody. Why don't we stand to our feet and let's give God a sincere praise. Hallelujah, Jesus. We bless your name, Jesus. We give you the glory tonight. We give you the honor, Jesus. We bless your holy name. For you are the only true and living God. You're the only wise God. To you be all glory, be all honor, be all praise. Dominion and power to your name, God. Come on, somebody give him that praise tonight. Hallelujah. We bless your name, Jesus. We give you the glory tonight. We bless your name. You're holy, you're righteous, Jesus. There's nobody like you. Somebody said there's nobody like you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We bless your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
you, Jesus, for you're the only true and living God. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. There's nobody like you, Jesus. Nobody like you. Hallelujah to your name. Amen. Why don't we give that name praise one more time? He's worthy this evening. Jesus, we love you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah. Amen. It feels good in the house of the Lord this evening. Amen. 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 Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, it's good to see you in church on a Sunday evening. Amen. There's no better place to be than in his presence with his people. Amen. There's no God like Jehovah. He's our provider, whatever you need this evening. Amen. He's our healer. Amen. If you have a need, we're going to go into a season of prayer. The elders of the church would get ready uh, and get the oil ready. If you have a sickness in your body, there's a sickness going around right now. I know there's some people home. There's probably some people in this service tonight that don't feel very well, but we know a God that can heal. Amen. That can touch our bodies. Amen. He's the God that healeth all of our diseases. Amen. So if you have a need, we'll invite you to come forward this evening. If you have an unspoken request, you can make it known by the lifting of your hand. Amen. Let's remember to pray for one another. God sees every need. Why don't we pray this evening? Jesus, we love you. Thank you for your goodness, your presence that's in this place. God, we don't take it lightly what you're doing, your unseen hand, God, that's moving in this place. God, the mind you're touching, the bodies you're touching right now, the healing, God, that's being performed, God. You're, you're the way maker, Jesus. You're a healer. You're a provider. God, we love you. Thank you for what you're doing. God, you see every unspoken request, every hand that was raised, everyone that stepped out by faith. God, you're able to do above and beyond what we could ever ask or think. God, we're calling on your name tonight, the name of Jesus. Do a work in this place. God, everyone that's sick, everyone that's home fighting whatever this virus is, God, we pray that you would touch their bodies this evening, God. Oh, we plead your blood in the name of Jesus. God, would you move in the remainder of this service? Would your anointing have free course, God, in every life, every heart, every mind? God, do a work as only you can do this evening, and we'll give you praise. Now with your voices lifted, why don't we begin to thank him for what he's doing right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing. We give you praise, God. We give you glory and honor. Hallelujah.
Oh, come on, why don't we glorify and lift that name up right now? Come on, I invite you to join me. It's easy. Jesus, we love you. We worship you, God. Be exalted, Jesus, right now. Be exalted in this place tonight, Jesus. Oh, we worship you. We praise you. What a sweet presence of God is in this sanctuary. Amen. First of all, we want to say thank you to each and every one of you for taking time to join us in the house of God. Amen, Christian Growth Center. We understand that you could be anywhere, and yet you took time to be in the house of God tonight. And we thank you for that. We do have a few announcements. Please remember that women's prayer is May 13th at 8 a.m. All of the women are invited to participate in that. It is free of charge. <laughs> also, please remember there is a mother-daughter brunch the same time or the same date, excuse me, at 12:30 p.m. If you want more details about that, you can touch base with Hermana Mariana or Hermana Juana. Sister Juana's right there. Sister Maddie's right here singing in the choir. If you need more information about that, touch base with them. Once again, that is May 13th at 1230 p.m. Also, coming up in the month of July is Heroes Vacation Bible School. I know that's a ways off, but the reason we're announcing that is if you want to be a part of that, if you want to help in any way, shape, or form, Hermana Mariana is having... She just loves me and called that. That's why I do that. Sister Mariana is having a meeting immediately following this service. So if you want to help out in VBS in any way, shape, or form, as soon as tonight's service is over, find Hermana Mariana and touch base with her. <laughs> touch base with her. And that is going to be a wonderful time. Also, the Memorial Day picnic is coming up. This is a long-held tradition in Christian Growth Center that we all get together on Memorial Day. And we have a gigantic celebration. We have a picnic as a church. That will be May 29th at 1130 a.m. If you need directions to where that will be, you can find myself after the service, and I can tell you where that will be. Also, please see Sister Mediana and sign up to bring food. We all pitch in every year to make sure there's plenty of food. Sister Mediana is taking care of the sign-up sheet to make sure that we all don't bring soda or we all don't bring chips or we all don't bring hot dogs. So please touch base with her. Sign up to bring something. It's always a wonderful time. If you need a ride, you can get a hold of myself, and we can make sure to get you a ride there. It is free of charge, but where it's at, there is a small admission fee to get into that park. So, once again, if you need more details on how to be a part of that, you can find myself after the service. I can give you all the details you need. Please see Sister Mediana to sign up to bring something. Now, with all the announcements out of the way, how many of you are excited and ready to have church tonight? Oh, come on. How many of you are really excited? You just can't contain yourself. <laughs> Why don't you reach across the aisle, find somebody, shake their hand, hug someone's neck, welcome them to the house of God tonight.
Somebody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's offering time, blessing time in the house of God. Amen. I was thinking of a story of a man, maybe you've heard it before, but he was trying to decide how much he was going to give to God. So he came up with this idea that he was going to draw a circle on the ground and throw all of his money up in the air, and whatever landed outside of the circle, that was going to be God's. But then he got to thinking to himself, maybe maybe too much will land out there, and I won't have enough for what I need. And he said, so I'm going to, instead of that, I'm going to draw the circle on the ground, I'm going to throw the money up in the air, and whatever lands inside the circle, I'll give that to God, and the rest of it I will keep. But again, he didn't really have control over that, and he said, okay, I've got it. I'm going to draw a circle on the ground, I'm going to throw the money up in the air, and whatever God wants, he's going to keep. But we do that, don't we? Amen. We try to talk ourselves out of giving freely, a free will offering unto God. Amen. Can I tell somebody this evening, you cannot outgive God. You can't. It is impossible. I, I, I challenge you to try it. God will pour out blessings upon you. God will give more freely than you will be able to. Amen. It's time to give of our tithe and his offering. Let's put up our scripture this evening. Let's read it together. But the land, whither you go to possess it, it is a land of hills and valleys, and drinketh water of the rain of heaven, and a land which the Lord thy God careth for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it, from the beginning of the year, even unto the end of the year. Amen. If you believe that this evening, bring your tithe and offering with joy in your heart.
an awesome God. Amen. High five somebody and say, he is an awesome God. That wasn't the right neighbor. High five somebody else and say, he is an awesome God. That still wasn't the right neighbor. High five somebody else and say, he is an awesome God. Now praise him like he's an awesome God. Come on, if you believe that he's an awesome God, go ahead and give him a praise. Great and mighty is he. Great and mighty is he. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody ought to clap your hands. Give God the praise that he's worthy of. He is awesome. Oh, he's awesome. Praise God. Praise God. I tell you what. In this world that we live in, we need an awesome God. How many would believe he's able? He's able. He's well able. Praise God. I want to say how absolutely uh, delighted that we are to have all of our guests and our visitors with us. So glad that they could come to be with us. Amen. Praise God. And uh, so glad to have Ryan with us. Ryan, we're so honored that you came to be with us tonight, sir. And Danielle, so glad that Danielle and her friend is with her. God bless them. And if I missed you, and I'm great at mispronouncing names. I am the world's best at mispronouncing names. So if I do that, please forgive me. Or if I did miss you and you are a guest here tonight, uh, just charge it that I'm getting to be an older man. I'm not an old man, but I'm an older man. Praise God. But we're so thrilled and so honored for all of our guests and our visitors. And what a mighty move of God around this house today. Amen. How many of you have been enjoying what God is doing? And uh, we live in a day where uh, the enemy is trying to marginalize coming to church. Now, you know, if you're sick, I get it. If you're throwing up and other stuff, probably ought to stay home. But, you know, uh, some people just use a sniffle. I got a runny nose, Pastor, so I better. I, I, well, it, it just seems to be the trend of our day as the enemy tries to marginalize church. So you know what that does? That really makes me appreciate you wonderful saints of God that are so faithful to the house of God. And you just keep saying, come rain or shine. We are more faithful than snail mail. We are going to show up to the house of God. I think we ought to just give God another praise for faithful saints of God that love him, that show up and are faithful to his ways. Praise God. I do want to say that uh, we do have um, uh, double portion. The Experience Youth Conference is coming up, and that is June the 29th and the 30th. And you will be hearing a lot about this. I am so excited about that. I have pastors and pastor's wives that are calling me saying, what are those dates again? Where can we get hotels? And I am so excited because there are young people that are willing to drive from all over the United States to come and be with us. And they are going to be blessed by the ministry of, of Brother uh, Cornelius Williams. He has preached here before. It won't be the last time that he's preached here. And... Uh, that he preaches here, excuse me, get my grammar correct, and uh, we love Brother Cornelius Williams and his family, and we are so thrilled and delighted that uh, God has given us the opportunity to use this man of God again. We also have that, uh, that's Thursday night, Friday morning at 11 o'clock will be Bishop Tom Johnson, and this man is a preacher you're fixing to find out. I've been listening to him since I was a little boy. I think he preached his first revival, or one of those first revivals for my parents, and Kansas many many years ago and he's still a great man of God and also that Friday night brother Bart Atkins, Pastor Bart Atkins Dr. Bart Atkins will be with us and so you don't want to miss this you want to put this on your calendar 
and God is doing great things. Now, how many of you have found the new carts? Raise your hands if you found the new carts. Okay, put your hands down. If you have not found the new carts, raise your hands. Okay. Now, all of you that have found the new carts, have, how many of you have taken new cards and passed them out to people? Raise your hand. Well, there's a few here. We got backsliders all over this house right now. <laughs> How many of you excited about what Jesus is doing at Christian Growth Center? How many of you will commit? Just one a day is all you got to do, brothers and sisters. Give this to one person a day. It's easy. Hallelujah. And you never can tell what Jesus will do. And uh, actually, we have the URL code on here. They are dragging me, kicking and screaming into the Mark of the Beast era. And uh, I don't plan on being here when his mark comes out. But anyway, uh, the URL is not the Mark of the Beast, by the way. But it sure is scary. <laughs> but we have it right there. If you scan that, yeah, w there's all kinds of goodies. You might, uh, you might be the recipient of angels that come down and bless you abundantly. I don't know. But anyway, this is a phenomenal tool of outreach and we want to make sure that our city knows that we love them. And anybody in this city is welcome to come and be a part of Christian Growth Center. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Praise God. Y'all are kind of anemic. Are you tired? I mean, Sunday, you're supposed to be tired. You're supposed to leave it all at the house of God. When you leave on Sunday night, you're supposed to be wore out. How many of you believe in giving all of it to God? Sunday's the first day of the week. It's our first fruits to God. We give everything we have to God on Sunday. And so I think all of you, I am not preaching tonight. I preached this morning. If you missed it, you missed it. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so, uh, but well, you can go online and listen to it. And then Brother Abe, I was here for Spanish outreach service and what a wonderful time great message from God I'm so excited about what Jesus is doing in Christian Growth Center in Pueblo Colorado and so uh, but I'm, I'm kind of uh, getting to the place where uh, Sunday nights belong to brother Mitchell Elder and we love him what an incredible word from God last Sunday night brother Mitchell come and follow the Holy Ghost where's your coat oh okay what are you doing? Trying to start a new fad around here? God bless him as he comes to preach tonight. <laughs> Took my coat off because there's work to be done tonight. I try real hard not to take my coat off. But I just had to take my coat off. If we could open our Bibles, Ephesians 6 and 12, I give honor to you, Bishop and Dad, First Lady and Mom. Love you both very much. Give honor to my wife. I give honor to everybody, okay? You start naming and then people get lost in the mix. I really do give honor to all of you faithful saints. I do. While you're turning there, this is different for me. I have heard men of God do this. I have seen and listened to Bishop do this. But I have come first tonight my first assignment from the Holy Ghost tonight is to preach to a spirit of this age and of this end time. And my second assignment tonight is to preach to that which is the only thing that can and does stand in between this world and that filthy spirit. And that is the bride of Christ, the church of the living God. Yes, I have come tonight with the anointing of God to confront the spirits of this city. 
and of this age. But in the name of Jesus, we will have victory. I said in the name of Jesus, we will have victory. Or for mi hermanas and mi hermanos, pero en el nombre de Jesús tendremos victoria. We will have victory. There will be a church in Pueblo, Colorado. The devils of Colorado will bow to the name of Jesus. I said they will bow to the name of Jesus. One more disclaimer before we get started. If you feel like this is a rant, if you feel like that the preacher in the pulpit tonight is attacking people, I ask you to listen all the way through this. Because with the issues that we're about to address, if we, the church, will be what God has called us to be, we will make a way for people to escape from the lies of the devil into the peace and protection of God. Ephesians 6 and 12 for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. The apostle didn't say that we don't wrestle. He said we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now turning to 2 Corinthians 10, 1 through 6. Second Corinthians 10, 1 through 6. Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence in base among you, but being absent in bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence, wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walk according to to the flesh for though we walk in the flesh we do not war after the flesh for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. The title I give us for the sake of remembrance this evening is this, A Christ-Centered Protest of the Political. A Christ-centered protest of the political. Why don't we lay our Bibles down and let's pray. Jesus, this is your word. These are your people. Their time is precious, God. Help us not to waste their time. Let your anointing step into this room right now, Father. I invite you into this room. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done. Jesus, tonight I'm asking you to shift some things in this city, in this state in this region and I'm asking tonight God that it would begin and it would never be the same that tonight God that you would begin to shift some things that you would begin to move on behalf of your people that you would begin to open our eyes to the anointing and the authority that you would give us a, a holy boldness tonight God I'm not asking tomorrow I'm not asking next week Jesus I'm asking right now God that it would begin right now tonight in this sanctuary in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus let it be done and everyone said in Jesus name you may be seated. There is a spirit in this age that seeks to silence the mouths of all believers, starting with those behind the pulpit, a one-world system of Satan that seeks to force people to shut 
their mouth. The spirit of this age says, shut up and get in line with everybody else. A spirit that seeks to steal deep-rooted biblical principles, biblical issues, and this spirit seeks to steal them and move them from the conversation of the religious to the conversation of the political a spirit that cries separation of religion and politics. And since this is now a political issue, we are discussing believers are not invited to invoke the moral teachings of Scripture. Oh, don't get your hope up. I'm not here to go on a political rant tonight. That's not The, the pulpit's not the place for that. Time fails to talk about what where the phrase comes from, a loose cannon. A loose cannon is a cannon that is broken free from its moors and is going chaotically back and forth in a ship. Time fails to talk about that tonight. But the pulpit is not the place for a loose cannon. But this spirit does as we used to say when we were kids. Now I apologize, I have no idea how you translate this. But when we were kids, we would, somebody would, would, would barge into the conversation, Brother Darius, and we would look at them and we would say, oh, excuse me, this is an A and B conversation, so see your way out of it. I don't know how that translates, but that's what the spirit of this age is trying to do. God has been systematically removed from the governments of the Western world. And in his absence, corrupted mortals seek to legislate that which only the divine could write in the hearts of humanity. Jeremiah 31 and 33, but this shall be the covenant that I, that's God, that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. There is no politician that can legislate morality, morality like the Holy Ghost can bring morality. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Christendom, what that means is all of Christianity. Christendom seems silenced on key issues of this day by fearing to be labeled as a racist, as a bigot, or homophobic, or transphobic, a fear monger, one of those crazy left or right wing individuals who should be labeled as domestic terrorists. Go read about some of the things that are going on in Canada and that are going on in Europe right now. Yes, people that are not afraid to stand in the pulpit and say, Thus saith the Lord, are, be are being labeled as domestic terrorists. This spirit seeks to do that, to, to label us as domestic terrorists, that we should be shadow banned. Now, if you don't know what that means, ask Brother Pound. Okay, I kind of have an idea what it means, but he can tell you what it means. To be shadow banned, to be silenced, to be canceled by big tech and godless corporations who seek not truth, but they seek justification for their godless lust. But beware, dear person. When seeking to silence the voice of the Christian in defense of the godless, moral issues were first and are always in the arena of the Christian. Why? For it is the Christian, not the politician, that seeks to be Christ's light. And Christ is the beginning of all morality. I said Christ is the beginning of all morality. It's not the politician that seeks to be Christ-like. Don't get me wrong. There are, there are politicians who seek to be Christians. But the Christian is the voice that speaks to morality. Okay, so this is where it's going to get tight. So what are some of these issues that the political world wants to say, be quiet, preacher. 
That's a political issue. We hear it over and over and over in the United States. Separation of church and state. But we hear it all over the Western world. Be quiet, preacher. Be quiet, Christian. Shut your mouth. Uh, this is a political debate. No, it's not. What are some of these issues? The first one that God directed me to speak about tonight is abortion. Abortion is not a political issue. Abortion is a moral issue. It does not matter how one tries to twist this argument into some hypothetical gobbledygook. Yes, that's Greek. No matter how they try to twist this debate into political and hypothetical nonsense, abortion in any form, in any way, is ending the life of the innocent, and that saint of God and that listener is murder. There's no way around it. Abortion is not something for the politician to decide. Abortion is decided by the omnipotence of God. It is God that gives life, and it is God that takes life, not the laws of men. What's our founding for this? Psalm 139, beginning at verse 13. For thou, God, that's who David's writing about. For thou hast possessed my, David's, reigns. Thou hast covered me. Where? Where was David covered? In my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret. What is David addressing? A David is addressing him being created in the womb of his mother. And even in the womb of his mother, God was already shaping David. God was already forming David. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. We're reading about how a child is formed in the womb. And in thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet they were none of them. How, listen to this. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me or towards me. How precious are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I wake, I am still with thee. I don't speak against people tonight. Don't get me wrong. I understand that people are misled and people are deceived and therefore they have an abortion. If you've had an abortion, God can forgive you. Just as much as God hates abortion, God loves you and God can forgive you. I speak not against people imprisoned by this spirit, but tonight I speak first directly to this spirit. Filthy spirits of this age, no matter how you try to twist and turn this debate into pol something political and therefore off limits to the pulpit, off limits to the Christian, off limits to the religious. Abortion is a sin. It is not a political debate. It is a moral sin against God and against that unborn child. Genesis 9 and 6, uh, whoso sheddeth man's blood, uh, by man shall his blood be shed, uh, for, it in, for in the image of God made he man. That child is not a mistake. That child is not a mistake. Uh, parents, you may have made a mistake, uh, but that child did not make a mistake. Don't pawn your sin off uh, on the innocent unborn. Don't do it. That child is created in the image of God. And if inception took place, if conception took place, it is the will of God. 
Quit all these hypotheticals. Well, if such and such and so and so and thus and thus, you are making excuses for the spirits of this age. Exodus 20, 13, thou shalt not kill. Deuteronomy 5, 17, thou shalt not kill. Psalm 127, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrow, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Anybody thankful for that? Now listen to this. Lo, children are an inheritance, are an heritage of the Lord. And the fruit of the womb is His, is God's reward. It doesn't matter how that child was conceived. That child is the blessing of God. It doesn't matter how that child was conceived. That, that child... That unborn baby is the blessing of Almighty God. Matthew 19 and 8, Jesus said, Thou shalt do, thou shalt do no murder. Romans 13 and 9, For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill. It doesn't matter what the left says. It doesn't matter what the right says. It doesn't matter what the middle says. This is not a political debate. Thus saith the Lord, thou shalt not kill. Period. God gave no grounds for slaying a child. God gave no grounds for abortion. So what does man think that he is? That he can step into the place of the divine and give orders for the Lord. You're a fool if you think that you can step into this Bible and begin to change things because you're bewitched by the spirits of this age. So what's another issue? What's another moral issue that's trying to be shoved into the realm of the political, the arena of the political, and removed from the pulpit of the church? Homosexuality. Now listen, this is not a rant against people that suffer from homosexuality. This is not a rant against people that are bound in that bondage. This is to speak to the spirit of that bondage. Homosexuality is not just a way that people are born. I don't care what your so-called doctor said or what your fake scientist said, you are not born homosexual. That's a lie from the devil. You are not born a homosexual. It is a spirit That seeks to corrupt and pervert God's human creation. And it is sin. And no political or spiritual power has the right to say anything otherwise. Levit Leviticus 18, 20 through 23. Moreover, now this is going to get a little blunt. I apologize. But sometimes the word of God is blunt. Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her. And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire of Molech. Neither shalt thou profane the name of the... Of, excuse me. Neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. Thou shalt not lie with my mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself otherwise. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down thereof. It is confusion. So... Preacher that all of a sudden feels like you can justify it. Where are you going to draw the line in that verse? You want to say that fornication is okay? You want to say that homosexuality is okay? Okay, then is bestiality okay? Is pedophilia okay? Where are you going to draw the line, man of God? Where are you going to draw the line, politician? Are you going to draw the line at 18 or 21 or 15 or 12 or 5? You coward. Why are you reading all of that?
that, Brother Mitchell, because there are false prophets, political and spiritual, of the Western world that want to say homosexuality is okay. It's not. Where do we as Christians draw the line? We draw the line where God drew the line. God said it's all wrong, so it's all wrong. It's not up to me to decide. God said fornication is sin. God said adultery is sin. God said homosexuality is sin. God said bestiality is sin. And God said pedophilia is sin. It's all sin. And no spirit of this age will dictate what things we will preach out of the Bible and what things we cannot. Leviticus 20, 13, if a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them had committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. That's not my words. That's God's words. If you have a problem with that, take it up with him. Let me clarify. We live in the dispensation of grace. So right now, those that live in the life of homosexuality, in the, in, in the lifestyle of homosexuality, they are experiencing the grace of God. Just like somebody that's living in fornication is experiencing the grace of God. Just like somebody that lies is experiencing the grace of God. Just like the thief or the murderer is experiencing the grace of God. But listen to me, all of those sins, there is coming a day when that sin will be judged. And if that sin is in your life, you will be judged with that sin. If that sin is in my life, I will be judged with that sin. Romans 1, 26 and 28, for this cause, God gave them up to vile affections for, I'm not trying to be blunt, but right now you would say, well, all the scriptures talked about is men. Okay, we'll go to the other side. For their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Is that clear enough? And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God, that's why all of this is going on. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Therefore, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things that are not convenient. It's sin. It's wrong. It's not something for our political system to decide. The Word of God decided this long before there was ever a United States of America. And I do not care how great this nation becomes. It is never great enough to change the words of God. Or any other nation. They cannot change this book. God is not a man that he should lie. So what's another stolen moral issue? The church is now supposed to just shut our mouths about and accept. And we're just supposed to tippy-toe around it. Same-sex marriage. It doesn't matter what your title or position is. You do not define marriage. God defines marriage. Senator, representative, Supreme Court justice, president, governor, citizen or non-citizen, saint, sinner, whatever you want to name, whatever title you want to come up with, God did not ask for our definition of marriage. God instituted marriage, and if it needs to change, God will change it. Last time I checked, he hasn't changed it. The spirits of perversion in this world do not define marriage. God does. Period. Genesis 2, 20 through 25. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to the beast of the field. But for Adam, but for Adam, there was not found an help meet for him. 
There wasn't found a helper. There was found no companion. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept. And he, God, took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man. Listen to the language here. The rib that the Lord God took from the man made he a woman. And brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a singular, therefore shall a man leave his father and, mo and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, singular. And they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. And some would say, well, that's all the way in the Old Testament. And, and for some reason, some people think you can throw away the whole Old Testament as if it didn't matter. And they say, well, Jesus never addressed this issue. I beg to differ with you. Matthew 19, 3 through 6, the Pharisees also came unto him, Jesus, tempting him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he, who's the he? God, that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this cause, who said that? God said, and for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. The spirit of this age would love nothing more than for the church to surrender this ground to the spirit. But this is not an issue for some elected or non-elected persons to decide who are under the influence of some perverted spirit. Marriage is still an institution by God and it is defined as follows. A man married to a woman for until death do us part. That's it. That's final. You don't get to change that. I don't get to change that. God put that in his word. The president doesn't get to change that. The Supreme Court doesn't get to change that. And no other nation on this earth gets to change that. Marriage is a man, a singular man, married to a singular woman until death do them part. Some of you that know your way around the Bible a little bit better are asking for me to address the issue of divorce. That's not what I'm talking about tonight, okay? There are certain grounds in the Word of God for divorce, but they are very few, and they are very clear. In times past, before one would be canceled for saying things like this, I've heard preachers say, and I'm going to say it, and I'm not making fun. I'm making a point. But they would say that in the beginning, God did not create Adam and Steve. God did not create two Adams and one Eve. God did not create two Eves and one Adam. God created Adam and Eve. And that is what God deemed as marriage. Anything else out of that bounds is out of the boundaries of marriage. I knew it'd get tight. I will not be silent about this. I don't care what laws they pass. I don't care what ideas they come up with. I don't care what fake debates that they come up with. They do not define the bounds of marriage. God does. The church will not shut our mouths about this. 
This is not decided in the Supreme Court. This is not decided at a, vo at a voting station. This was decided from the beginning. Why are you preaching like this, preacher? Because there is a lying devil and devils seducing and lying devils uh, that run around in this city and they convince young men and they convince young women that it's okay to have sex outside of wedlock. Uh, they say it's okay to fornicate. They say it's okay to live in adultery. And so they do it. And then they suffer condemnation. And then once the condemnation comes and the deed is done, now all of a sudden there's a child involved. And so that lying spirit comes back and says, that child's a problem, Brother Hicks. Why don't you have an abortion? And so mom and dad have an abortion because of the same spirit. That's why I won't shut my mouth about this. Because the kingdom of that spirit in this city is coming down starting tonight. Abortion is wrong. Fornication is wrong. Adultery is wrong. Homosexuality is wrong. It's not the will of God for a mom to have an abortion and be so suffering from depression that she takes her own life. That's not the will of God. It's not the will of God for, for the status quo of Pueblo, Colorado to be broken and dysfunction. The status quo of Pueblo, Colorado is to be divinely anointed and blessed by God. And over my dead body, devil, will I watch you do this anymore? That's why I'm preaching like this. I'm preaching like this because Satan, that same spirit, is demanding that the church and the pulpit stay silent while little kids are told that it's normal to be sexually involved with the same sex. That's child abuse. That's child abuse. That is child abuse. They want to tell these little five, six, seven, eight year olds that those feelings are normal. That's not normal. That's sin. And so, young man, they tell these other young men this when they go to school and when they get their jobs. They tell them that it's okay. It's okay if you're a guy to like a guy to fall in love with them. It's okay if you're a woman to fall in love with another woman. I'm not backing up one inch. That spirit has ruled long enough in this city. And so what do they do, young man? They do all that they know to do. The teacher said it's okay. Mom and mom said it's okay. I said that on purpose. Mom and mom said that's okay. And dad and dad said that's okay. So now you got little boys and little girls running around holding the same sex's hand. And then it goes farther. And I'll spare you the details. But it goes farther. And now all of a sudden that little boy or that little girl is suffering from condemnation to the point where in the United States right now they are killing themselves by the thousands. Where are you at, politicians? You say that you could save us? That's what I'm saying. This is not the arena of the political. This is the arena of the church. I don't care what party you vote for. They're not going to fix it. Satan has lost his mind. If he thinks that this preacher or this pulpit or this church is going to be bullied into the corner to just ignore the slaughter and maiming of hundreds and thousands and millions of souls. He's lost his mind. Hear me, devil. You've lost your mind. What's another issue? Transgenderism. The confusion of precious people transitioning from one sex to the other as if that's even really possible. But they're told that it's the new norm and it's normal to do that and that gender's fluid. And so people are trying to transition from male to female and from female to male. Exactly what the Bible said it is. It's confusion. And God is not the author of confusion, but he is the author of power and of love and of a sound mind. Genesis 1, 26 and 27, and God said, not man, not the person I voted for, not the person that God is weighing, however, or her, however. No, God said, 
Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. That's why all of this is going on in this city because the spirits, the prince of Pueblo is terrified that if enough people figure out why they were created, they will walk in dominion. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowls of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God made man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Show me one place in the Bible where Adam chose his gender. Show me one place in the Bible where anybody got to debate with God what they were created. Shall the, shall the clay say to the potter? That's in your Bible. That's in my Bible. Does the clay have the authority to say to the potter, what are you making? It's not your choice whether you're male or female. It's God's choice. God made you a man or God made you a woman. You ought to revel in that. You ought to thank God for that every day. And you ought to be all that that entails. If you're a woman, be a woman. If you're a man, be a man. <laughs> Genesis 2 and 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul verse 22 and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man listen to me precious young person if the devil is lying to you about what sex you are don't surrender to that confusion Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. And let him make you whole. If Jesus could make you a man or a woman the first time, then God can put you back together as the same thing that he created you to be. Quit listening to the lies of this city. Quit listening to the devils of this age that are telling you that you'll never be anything for God. And you're confused. And one minute you think you're a man, and the next minute you think you're a woman. Stop listening to that garbage. Come to Jesus. He said, come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We're almost done. What are you doing, preacher? Remember our title? I'm protesting. That makes some of you uncomfortable. Oh, no. There is a way that Christians protest. There is a way that we protest, Brother Darius. There is a way that Christianity rises up in the face, not of governments, not of the political system, but of the spirits that control those governments, of spiritual wickedness in high places. There is a way, young lady, that we rise up and protest. So what are you doing? I'm protesting. Oh, not against the left, not against the right, but I am standing up in opposition of every vile spirit of this city and of this age, and I am telling them no, a thousand times no. It will be over my dead body. Literally, over my dead body will I be quiet about what the Bible says. Not in our city. I said not in our city. Not in our homes. Not in our schools. Not in our jobs. Not in our cars, Sister Jess. Not in our buses. Not in our Sunday school rooms. Not in our youth group. Brother and Sister Connor, not in our Spanish outreach service. Brother Richard, not in our music department. Not in our youth services. Over my dead body, Satan. Over my dead body, will you silence the word of God? <laughs> and guess what, young people? Guess what, saint of God? You can protest too. Now, 
No. Not with a picket sign and a march to D.C. That's not going to change a thing. If you have not figured out that the political system will do whatever it wants to do, whether you vote or don't vote or who you vote for or don't vote for, they will do what they want and they will line their pockets with gold. But greater is he that's inside of me than he that's in the world. And when this nation is dead and gone and forgotten in history, there will still be a church. There will still be the bride of Christ. Not in my city. So how do we protest? If we don't protest with picket signs and rioting in the streets and and burning and ranting and raving, how do we protest, young person? We protest like Daniel. Three times a day. Three times a day. Daniel walked into his place of protest. Three times every single day, this man of God made his way to his room and found himself on his knees and said, Oh, Lord, hear. Oh, Lord, forgive. Oh, Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake. Oh, my God, for thy city and for thy people. That are called by thy name, Brother Pound. Can you put that up there in Spanish? Now forgive me. For for whatever reason, I feel like I need to learn Spanish. Papo. When I started reading this in prayer, some of you can think I'm out of my mind. I, I probably am. But the other night I walked into the sanctuary and I started praying. And I felt God tell me, pray in Spanish. And I said, God, I don't know how to pray in Spanish. I felt it again, praying Spanish. So I got an app on my phone, and I started looking up prayers. I don't know why, but when I began to read this, I got all the way down. Oye, Señor. Oh, Señor, perdona. Presta oiro. Señor, y also, as lo, excuse me, no tardes, por amor de, mi, de ti mismo. And I continue to read, Dios mío. My God, por qué tu nombre es invocado sobre tu ciudad y sobre tu. What's that word? Say it. What's that word? Where do you live? And I begin to weep. When's the last time, saint of God, that you came into the sanctuary and you laid on your face in a place of protest and you begin to cry out, God, save my city. Or in Espanol, oh, Dios, salva mi ciudad. When's the last time, young person, that you prayed, God, would you revive my city? Dios, reviva mi ciudad para tu gloria, para tu honra. I protest, Michaela. I don't protest like all the other liberals or conservatives or right wings or left wings. I don't protest like that, but I protest. I protest in the spirit. Every time I walk into this sanctuary, I'm standing in protest. Every time I clap my hands, I'm standing in protest. Say to God, every time you say amen, it is a speaking of a kingdom to come. It's not even in my notes, but you can, I, I think it's John 8. And maybe John 18, that Jesus, I think it is John 18. (coughs) Jesus says that my kingdom is not of this world, but if it were, my servants would fight for me. Jesus didn't say that there wasn't a kingdom. He said it wasn't a kingdom of this world. So we protest like Daniel. We protest like Abraham. Genesis 12 and 5 says, And Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother, and all their substance that they had gathered. And pay attention here. And all the souls that they had gotten in Haran. I begin to read. One Hebrew rabbi began to talk about how what he believes and what other rabbi, Hebrew rabbis believe. And, I, and I've tried, Bishop, to find this where I found this and I can't. So you could take it or leave it. I don't really care. But not to Bishop, to you guys. But I, I just, 
I tried to find it. So if you asked, I could show you. I can't find it anymore. But that phrase and the souls that they had gathered, they believed that what Abraham was doing was going throughout that city. He was going throughout Ur and he was finding every person that he could and he was converting them to monotheism. And when Abraham left Ur, all of those souls left with him. That's how we protest, Carly. We go knock on a door. Oh, I can vote and it's not going to do much. But if I can save a soul... Abram knew he couldn't buck the political system of his time, so he appealed to a higher form of protest. I can't tell you many of the kings of Ur, but I can tell you who Abraham was. Because long when that city was dead and gone, because Abraham learned to protest in a Christocentric way or in a Christ-centered way, his name lives on in God's Word. Daniel 12 and 3. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. When's the last time you want a soul saying to God? It's quiet. When's the last time? So we, not you, we. So we have to ask ourselves, if we don't like the violence in our city, when's the last time we knocked on a door? If we don't like the violence in our streets, Brother Darius, when's the last time we taught a Bible study? If we don't like the drug culture or, or the immoral culture of Pueblo, when's the last time we prayed all night? When's the last time we fasted for a week? How many times we sit around running our mouth in anger? And we'd do better to go run our mouth in prayer. I know I'm taking a long time. We're, we're wrapping up. So what's it going to be, saying to God? What's it going to be, young person? What's it going to be, young man? Are you going to talk about being something for God? Or are you going to be something for God? I don't mean that in, in, in arrogance or, or to hurt you, but I mean that in the challenge of the Holy Ghost. Are you going to talk about being something for God or are you going to be something for God? You feel a call to preach? You don't need a pulpit to preach. You need a Bible in a street corner to preach. Get out there. You feel called to preach? Go preach. Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel. You'll figure out if you're called to preach or not. Some of you are called to preach. And you're afraid of it. You're afraid of what it means. You're afraid of the consecration. I preached it last week. Don't run from the darkness. Confront it. Young lady, are you going to be something for God? Or are you just going to talk about it? Middle-aged, older saints of God, are you going to do something for God? Or are you going to talk about it? Am I going to do something for God? Or am I going to talk about it? If I don't like what's going on in this city, what am I doing to change it? And I don't mean voting. I mean, what am I confronting in the spirit? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. Brother Richard, if you'd come, we close. Are we going to be like all the other people in Daniel's time? Are we going to be like all those Jews that were there when the king said bow? And they bowed. Is that what we're going to be like? Or are there some Hananiahs and Azariahs and Mishael saying no? No. I may not be holding a picket sign in some street right now for some political pawn, but I will protest on behalf of my lost and dying city. I will protest. So how? How do we have change? Matthew 17, 20 and 21, And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If ye have faith, as the grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, 
remove hence to yonder place, and it shall be done. And nothing shall be impossible unto you. How be it? We love that first part. Let's read the next verse. How be it this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. You want to affect change, young person? Go on a seven-day fast and meet God in this altar every night and pray until things change. You want to see the abuse stop in your friends' lives and you want to see the drugs and the guns stop coming into schools? Go vote if you want to. But if you really want to change something, come to this altar and pray like Daniel. Oh, Lord, hear. God, forgive. Hearken and do and defer not. Do it right now, God. That's what it means, and defer not. Don't wait. Don't wait, God. Don't wait till there's another school shooting. Don't wait till there's another drug overdose, God. Do it now. This kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Isaiah 58 and 6. Is this not the fast that I have chosen to loose the bands of wickedness? This is when you're not just fasting because it's a cool thing to do. This is when you're fasting because you found the mind of God. And look what happens. To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free. And that who? That God breaks every yoke? That ye break every yoke. That is the fast that God has prepared. 2 Chronicles 7, 14, 15. We all, most of us could quote this. If my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will hear their land. Now mine eyes shall be open. God's looking. He's looking, young man. Is he going to find you in a place of prayer? Mine eyes shall be open and my ears, my ears attend to the prayer that is made in this place, young lady. God's listening for your voice at prayer time. God's listening for your voice early in the morning. God's listening for your voice late at night. Is he going to find you there? Or are you too busy playing games? I'm not backing up one inch. There will be victory in this city. James 5 and 20. Let him know. That he which converteth the sinner from the error of his ways shall save a soul from death. It shall hide a multitude of sins if we could stand. If you've been here long enough, you've heard Bishop tell the story. I'll close my notes. I preached way too long. If you've been here long enough, you've heard Bishop tell the story. But this story came to my heart in closing. World War II. Brother the Hicks. Nazis doing their best to exterminate in their racist hatred the Jews and not just the Jews many others and so what did this madman possessed by a devil what did Hitler do he created death camps how we could call them concentration camps they were death camps the execution of anyone that this madman didn't like He would send them to these death camps. Jews, preachers, gypsies, African Americans. Well, Africans. I don't know if you could say African Americans. Because they were from Germany and the outlying areas. Anyone or anything that his racism and bigotry hated, he sent them to these camps. I don't know where it was at, Bishop. You, you probably know. Maybe I should just have you tell the story. But there's a little church in a certain city. And the way that they would transport these people, you can read about it at nauseum. In book after book, the way that they would transport these people in masses, they would march them on death marches or they would put them into cattle cars. And cram them in so tight that people would literally suffocate. Leave them in these cattle cars for hours and days. No food, no water, no covering over them. Winter, summer, heat, rain, snow. It didn't matter. They didn't care. They weren't people. 
That's how they thought. At this little church, There's a railroad track that ran right behind this little church. And those trains would go by that little church. And daddies would cry for someone to come and save their family. And mamas would cry for someone to come and get my little baby. Just take my baby. And this little church position where it could make change, where it could affect change, but in fear, in fear of the spiritual wickedness in high places, in fear of the powers of darkness that would be when that train would go by and they would hear the screeches and the screams of help and change and do something for us and do something to help our family instead of that preacher rising up and going out to help. That preacher would tell his congregation, worship louder. That preacher would tell his congregation, turn the music up. That preacher Preacher would tell his congregation, pray a little bit louder, not for the salvation of his country, but so he wouldn't hear the cries of those that were headed to their death. So what are we going to do, Christian Growth Center? We're just like that little church in a city with a spiritual train track to hell in it. And what are we going to do with the cries that we hear? Save my baby. Save my mama. Save my daddy. Save my uncle. Save my aunt. You insert it there. Help me get out of this drug addiction. Help me get out of this bondage. I can't do it for you. You got to do it. We all got to do it together. These altars are open tonight. I'm not trying to put you on a guilt trip. If you're fine with where you are, you don't have to come down to this altar. But there's some young people and there's some saints of God. They're done hearing the cries for change. They're ready to be the change. I don't want the proverbial noise in my life to get so loud that I can't hear the cries of desperate souls. I don't want my hobbies to be so many that I don't have time to go knock a door. I don't want my job to consume me so much that I don't have a time for Bible studies. Come on, Christian Grove Center. Can you confront the darkness? We wrestle not against flesh and blood. But young lady, we do wrestle. We do stand up and cry out. We do stand up and ask God for change. We don't do it like the world does it. We don't do it like everybody else around us. But we do affect change. Young lady, we affect change in the way we dress. Understanding that I am separate and holy unto God from this world. I don't do this because my pastor tells me to do this. I do this in protest of the kingdom of this world. Come on, mama. Come on, daddy. Let's change something. Come on, young man, when's the last time your lunch break became a prayer time? Because the will of God was more important than the food you were eating. Come on, young person, when's the last time that the Holy Ghost hit you so strong you had to ask a teacher, can I go pray? I've got to pray right now for my school. I've got to pray right now for my city. Come on, men of Christian Grove Center. When's the last time we interceded? 
I'm not talking about just praying for our food. When's the last time we interceded for this city? Come on, saints of God, there's a city out there. There's a city out there to reach. There's young ladies, they don't want to have an abortion, but they don't know what else to do. There's young men, they don't want to live a homosexual lifestyle, but they don't know how to get out of it. There's people, they don't want to, tra- they don't want to, to be a transgender. They, they don't want to transition from male to female. They don't want to transition from male to female, from female to male. But the devil's in their ear and, there's, and he's lying to them. The devil's telling them, you don't know who you are. You don't know what you are. Try this, try that. Come on, young person, you're the change. You're the change in this city. You're the change in your school. You're the change in your neighborhood. You're the change on your job. You're the change in your family.